Carolina for 58 years. The life story that you will see is one with a multitude of achievements from high school to the present. And when a new history book is written of South Carolina, this person deserves a chapter relating to these. This, of course, is the life of Coach Frank Collins, the profile of a legend. And now your host, Dave Rogers. This is the birthplace of Frank Howard in 1909. The tiny community was and still is called Barlow Bend, Alabama, a name which has become second nature to South Carolinians. From this modest home came a person destined to become one of South Carolina's and Alabama's all-time favorite people. Although he is retired, Coach Frank Howard is still active as he goes to his small office every day. We will join Coach Howard as he tells of his boyhood days through high school and University of Alabama and on to his first coaching job, which was track and football assistant at Clemson University. It wasn't the last thing Coach Neely told me when he left here. He said, don't ever let these folks talk you into a big bill in a big stadium. He said, go there behind the Y and put you in 10,000 bleacher seats. He said, that's all you'll ever need. He came back and took him in the Clemson Athletic Hall of Fame in about 84, and he saw that big stadium. He looked at it, saw them 80,000 people out there. He said, I never would have believed anything like this. <laughs> mother and father lived in Barlow Bend, Alabama. That's way out in the country. And frankly, I never saw a white boy until I was five years old till I moved to Mobile. And we had a big farm out there. We raised cotton and corn, had a lot of people working for us. And they always had to have a, a garden and had to have chickens and had to have cows and pigs, things like that. About the only thing I believe my father gave them was uh, coffee and sugar and flour, and they had to raise the rest. And I don't think he paid them too well. And you know, back in those days, uh, people didn't get these big sours like you make now. <laughs> when I was a young boy, I don't remember much about uh, uh, football or baseball or anything else. Uh, we didn't have sports out in Barlow Bend, but when I moved to Mobile, it uh, changed a little bit. Uh, they had all kind of sports. Boys played, and uh, they'd go out on the playgrounds and swing and uh, do things like that. And of course, when you got up around 12 or 14 years old, you started taking part in athletics. I think the first sport I ever played was baseball. I was a catcher in baseball, and not bragging, but I was pretty good. Uh, I played three years in high school, and I played three years in college. I was offered a uh, contract with Chattanooga when I got out of college, and one of the best things that ever happened to me, I didn't take it. Uh, I went ahead and got my education at the University of Alabama, and uh, I ended up here at Clemson. When I was a, a junior in high school, now don't ask me what year it was, because frankly, I don't remember the years. <laughs> I can remember 40 years ago, a little better than I can two weeks ago, to be frank with you. But when I was in high school, uh, I started playing baseball. I made three letters in baseball when I was in high school. And when I, um, also in high school, I played uh, three years of basketball. And believe it or not, I didn't play but two years of football. Uh, I thought football was pretty rough. In fact, when I was in high school, I had a job at Smith's Bakery. And I worked at Smith's Bakery on a bread truck. Uh, this fellow and I um, used to deliver bread. I'd get up at 3.30 every morning, work till 7.30, get on my bicycle and ride home and freshen up, and then I'd get on my bicycle and ride to the high school. And that's about my routine all while I was in high school. Except uh, when I got a little older and could work inside the bakery, 
um, I uh, started uh, making pies. Can you imagine me making pies? And uh, I also would wrap uh, fruit cakes and I'd wrap pound cakes. And I remember very well, I love pound cakes. And every now and then I'd break one on purpose and eat the thing. One time <clears throat> uh, I was in high school and Smith Baker had a real fast uh, amateur team. And um, their catcher got hurt or got sick and couldn't play in the championship game. So they came out to high school because I'd worked at the bakery, was working at the bakery and was eligible. They told me, said, uh, our catcher got sick today. You got to come catch this ball game for us. Well, all of those fellas was uh, good ball players. I was about 15 or 16 years old. We was uh, behind one to nothing in the last inning and I had two strikes on me and no balls. And I'll tell you, those two strikes, I'd missed them at least three or four feet. And the next pitch, I hit it over the fence for a home run. And you know, Mr. Smith uh, reached in his pocket. He was so happy. He gave me everything he had in his uh, pocketbook. And he was a rich fella. But it so happened he'd just been to the bank and I didn't get but six dollars out of it. <laughs> Well, you know, really, I Howard, a guard on 29 and 30 University of Alabama teams, was quick, but not quite as fast as we see in some old University of Alabama film under Coach Wallace Wade. In eight seasons, Alabama won 61, lost 13, and tied two. There's little wonder why Coach Howard was a winner at Clemson. A teammate of Frank Howard was All-American and National Hall of Famer Fred Sington. Here he tells some experiences with Howard at Alabama. I had a great thrill today. Someone asked me if I'd ever known Frank Howard that went down to the University of Alabama with me. Well, Frank played guard next to me for four years, a squire of Barlow Ben that he liked to title himself. And we had a wonderful relationship, and where I first met him was a very unusual thing, too. In those days in football, back in 1927, you played down there on the campus, and if you did right, the coaches were real happy with you. If you didn't, they got after you. We had a coach named Hank Crisp, who was a very tough individual. Hank had one arm off, and he wore a leather cap on it, so that if you didn't do right, he could kind of get your attention. And Frank and myself were over there one day in practice, and we blocked the dummy, and the field was a big field there, and I blocked wrong, and Coach Chris told me to take a lap around the field, maybe I'd get impressed. So I started around the field, and uh, halfway around was where I met Frank Howard. Frank had blocked wrong, too, so uh, we became very close friends, and life was just most unusual there. The, different things and all. Incidentally, I might say Frank Howard probably won't remember this, but uh, Frank was a man at the dances. We had campus dances and Frank was a disciplinarian on those dances. He walked around the floor at the gym and he saw that nobody got out of line and that if anybody I think had, it was about $100 a month and that thing. was good money then. I remember I sent my mother $75 every month and I kept 25 and the fellow that had the job before me, they could call him all kind of names. He wouldn't do anything about it. So the first night I was the bouncer, one of them came in there, a boy, a student. He was drunk. I put him out. He says, will you meet me after the dance? I said, no, I'm not going to meet you after the dance. I said, I'm going to meet you right now. I took him outside and blacked his eyes. The word got around at that new bouncer. Uh, you better not fool with him, said he'll, he'll get with you. So I had very little trouble until one night the fellow that hired me, he was an assistant to the president, he hired me and he came in there a little tipsy and I put him out. The next morning I got a letter from him, but I went over there expecting to be fired and I was wondering, I said, well, I'm going to probably have to drop out of school. I won't have any money to send my mother. I won't have any $25 to spend. I said, I wonder why I did that. But I walked in his office, the first thing he said to me, he said, Frank, 
I want to ask a personal favor of you. I said, what's that, doctor? He said, I'd appreciate it immensely if you wouldn't make a report on my conduct to Dr. Denny, who was president. And I looked him right in the eye, and boy, I felt so good. I said, okay, mister. I said, I won't do it this time, but don't you ever let it happen again, you hear me? <laughs> we didn't get to go out like the fellows do today. They go to bowls, and I read about all the places they go, and out on boats, and all the wonderful things that happen. The day before the ball game, finally, Coach Wade walked in the dressing room that day, and he said, uh, well, I'll get you guys out today, and we thought, boy, finally he's relaxed. Well, he did. He took us out to an orange farm and let us pick two oranges each, about 30 miles from the hotel, and that was the big deal before the Rose Bowl game. If old Frank Howard happens to hear this, uh, I want to remind him that uh, he can't sing, and there was a song Rudy Valles dedicated to me called Football Fred in 31, and Frank used to sing it in my ear where I couldn't hear the signals, and I just want to tell him that I know his voice hadn't improved a darn bit. A lot of people asked me, said, uh, did you play with Bear Bryant? I said, no, I didn't play with Bear. I said, they brought him in between my sophomore and junior year. They tutored him two years to get him in. He never did get out, but he was president of the freshman class down there for six straight years. And believe it or not, in 1941, the bear called me and wanted a job as my assistant. I tell people the smartest thing I ever did in my life, I didn't hire him, because if I had hired him, within six months' time, he'd have cut my throat, drank my blood, had my job, and had us on probation for life. <laughs> well, I always thought a whole lot of old bear. I think he did of me, too. Uh, we've had some good times together. And I remember one time, he always had a policeman with him. And, um, they beat us, I think it was 20 to 14, and they was pretty lucky doing it. And I went across the field after the game to shake hands with him, and I put, took off my hat and just beat the devil out of him with my hat and his policeman stand there and just laugh like the devil. And after I got through whipping old Bear with the hat, this cop asked me, he says, Coach, come on down in this corner of the field. I want to get a picture of me and you. So. I think that cop liked me a little bit, too. Well, I'll tell you, that's a funny thing. Uh, I remember a, a boy named John Henry Sutha and I had a job at Hopkinsville, Kentucky. We were going up there to sign the contract on a Saturday. On a Friday, I got a letter from Coach Neely. He said, I can give you a job as my line coach, provided you can coach track. Well, Coach Neely was my baseball coach at Alabama. He knew I never had seen a track meet, but I thought uh, starting in college instead of high school was a pretty good way to start. So I took a $200 a year pay cut to come to Clemson instead of going to Hopkinsville, Kentucky. And I tell you, it's the best pay cut a fellow ever took in his life. I always liked what I was doing. I always liked it around Clemson. I always liked Clemson people. And I never considered doing anything else. But it's a funny thing, the first day I went on the field as a track coach, I had a boy come up to me and said, Coach, what form do you prefer on the javelin? Do you like the American form or the finish? Well, frankly, I never had heard of a javelin. So I told him, I said, son, you go to the library. They got a book over there called Track and Field by Harry Gill. I said, Mr. Gill is an authority. I said, you read that book and you do just exactly what he says. And the next year he set a, a state record in the javelin throw that wasn't beaten until about 30 years later. I used to tell him at coaching clinics, that's what you call coaching. When I came here, the, the Clemson coaching staff was composed of three, four people. Coach Neely, he coached football and baseball. Me, I coached football and track. Coach Davis, who is still living, he coached um, football and basketball. And Coach Jones coached freshman football, I believe, and also boxing. That was the Clemson coaching staff. It's not like it is today. But he's got a lot of assistants, and they got assistant athletic directors and associates, and they all got titles. 
I was walking down the hall and I saw one another morning. I said, good morning, A.D. And I'd be doggone if about 10 people didn't say, how you doing, coach? I learned how to do everything. I sold the tickets. I stayed in the canteen. I was the trainer. Uh, I cut the grass. We put up bleachers for the uh, one or two games we had on the campus every year. And I just learned how to do everything. I'd turn the lights off. We didn't have many lights because our uh, office wasn't but about two little small rooms. I got married to uh, an Anderson girl. Her name was Anna Tribble. We got married on August the 23rd, 1933. I never will forget it. Boy, I'm telling you, we used to go to dances and I couldn't hardly dance with her. So many boys would break. They used to have big dances here. You know. And uh, she was a real popular girl. And I don't know how uh, she picked me out or I picked her out, but it just happened. And we've been living happily ever since. The first super athlete to play under Howard was Bunks McFadden. He was the first and only athlete to make All-American in the same year in basketball and football. That year was 1939. Banks is a member of the National Football Hall of Fame. Coach Howard is a very enthusiastic type person, but he always was smart enough to know that uh, if he didn't have the best material, he took what he had and worked with it and made it the best it possible to be. He didn't expect anything that it wasn't possible for you to do, but he wouldn't take a second class performance in any way without letting you know it in no uncertain terms. Uh, he is a very de demanding type person because he wanted you to do the best with what the good Lord gave you with. I'll tell you one little lesson that happened to me in track, which was my senior year. And we were in a broad jump contest down at State Meet, which Coach Howard, of course, was the track coach. And a young man by the name of Little out of South Carolina had just broken the state track meet at 23 feet. And um, we needed to win this particular thing, to win the meet. And I asked Coach Howard, I said, would you put a handkerchief out at, in the pit off to the side at 22 feet so I'll have something to shoot for? And then in that way, maybe I will be able to jump a little bit further. And he said, don't worry about it. Go ahead and warm up. So I did, went back and prepared. And uh, I came down, and I figured if I could jump over that 22 feet that I probably could beat this particular boy. So uh, I thought I did the best that I possibly could do. And when I hit the pit, I was short a little bit of the handkerchief, really. It was very disgusting. I walked away, and he came over and grabbed me. And I started complaining about not doing better. And he said, don't worry, let's wait till the results are over with. And about that time, they announced that I had jumped 23 feet, four and three quarters inches. And I said, it can't be because I didn't get to the handkerchief. He said, you don't think I'm dumb enough, of course, to put it where you told me to, do you, McFadden? And so in that way, maybe he thought- Coach Howard had more in common in than just football with his players, as we hear from this former team member, fullback Mac Folger of the 1935 Tiger squad in his story of frog gigging. Well, he meant a lot to me and uh, in every way. He was like a daddy to me and a brother, too. We were pretty close to the same age. And uh, we used to fish together and frog gig together. And we used to go up in the mountain frog gigging, get a boatload of frogs. His technique wasn't so good as frog gigging. But there's a big lake there in Rocky Bottom. I don't think that lake's there now. But and we went up there with a boy named King Cole. He played under Frank and Jess Neely for a long about time I did. And uh, we went up there and I think we gigged over 100 frogs that night. And we used to go up there at Old Coney State Park and gig frogs. And fish, fish together. Uh, we've been through a lot. Howard's first offensive play from scrimmage as head coach at Clemson resulted in a touchdown. This play and others showed the competitive nature of all Tiger teams. Let's hear how he became head coach. We had a, a business manager here named J.C. Littlejohn, and Mr. Littlejohn was probably one of the finest people I ever met. 
Well, we was going out to play um, um, Boston College in the Orange um, um, Cotton Bowl in 1940. And on the way out, um, Miss Bluejohn told me we was riding back there in the smoker in the, on a Pullman car. He came back there and he told me, he said, now Coach Neely might leave him, but you're not going to leave, you're going to stay. We're going to make you our head coach if he leaves. Well, Coach Neely left. They had a meeting at the Athletic Council. I thought they just, I, I figured I'd already been hired because anything Mr. Bluejohn said, people believed around him. So um, one of them got up and he said, I, somebody nominated me. And um, uh, they didn't react very quick. So I said, I second the motion, but I really thought I'd already been elected. I didn't think it was <laughs> anything to it. Clemson's record from 1940 to 1948 was 36 wins, 38 losses, and two ties. When asked which was his best team, Howard comments and relates how proud he is of that team. Off of my first Gator Bowl team, I'm really proud of those boys. Uh, it's uh, six of them. Now believe this, it's six of them that's already millionaires. Uh, off of that Gator Bowl team. And we had boys like um, Paulus and Rabbit Thompson and Salisbury and Prince, Gillespie and Clanton, Steve Moore, Dick Henley, Dum Dum Wyndham, he was one of my favorites. Fred Cohn, he's probably the best one I ever had. Bobby Gage and uh, Calvert, uh, Jackie Calvert, and um, uh, Ray Matthews. All those boys were fine football players. And they did a real good job for us. And I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to play football for Coach Howard and to, and to be associated with a man like Coach Howard. He, he, I think he taught some things that, that has carried with me the rest of my life and, and has been a tremendous influence on where I've been and what I've done. And Coach Howard emphasized heavily uh, finishing college or finishing school. And I, I think that stands out in my mind. He, he emphasized that. Matter of fact, uh, uh, I can remember when he'd even check your grades every month to make certain that you were keeping the grades up. And if you didn't keep your grades up, uh, he'd make you go to tutoring classes at night. And, and that, that impressed me way back there because it, if he had not done that, bottom line with me is I wouldn't have finished Clemson. You know, the football is really fun and, and when you're there and it's, it's great but it doesn't live your life after you leave there. And he had some interest for the, the cultural side of life. You know, you look at Coach Howard, you think about a big, rough football coach, chews tobacco and all that, but he, that's not necessarily the real man underneath all that, in my opinion. And the real Frank Howard is a different person than that. He, in the first place, he leaves that image uh, that he's, you know, he's uh, kind of a country bumpkin type. Well, that, that's all an image. Coach Howard is a, is a brilliant fellow underneath all of that, and he's very uh, highly intelligent. And, and, and when he used to carry us on road trips, that, that was the thing that stands out in my mind, is how he would organize prior to the trip uh, going to these museums and art shows and things of that type. And, and you just don't relate that to Coach Howard, but he did it. In case Coach Harbour wouldn't remember me, my name is Billy Griggs, and I'm from Sluter, South Carolina, and Goat McMillan came down and recruited me. Uh, uh, one morning, just about daybreak, our mules had gotten out, and I was out on the edge of the road trying to chase the mules in, and I saw this car stop, and who steps out but Goat? He gets out, and he comes over, and he helps me put the mules back in the past, and, and Goat at that time was one of our assistant coaches at Clemson, so he came on in. In fact, Goat was also from Sluter, where I was living and he uh, recruited me and I came on and had breakfast with us and we, I went on to Clemson College. Anytime that you had a problem, this is what I always admired about Coach Howard. He wanted you to give everything you had on the football field, but if you had a problem, you go by his office and sit down and talk to it and he tried to help you out and tried to help solve this problem. And he did more than just coach football. He tried to make men and tried to prepare you for the future when you went out in this world. He'd already been out there. But there's one thing about Coach Howard that, that he keeps very, very close contact with his former football players. Anytime he's in the Greenville area, anytime you're in the Clemson area, I go by to see him. He always has time 
to sit there and talk to you, to find out how you're doing, how your children are doing, how your wife's doing, and how you're doing in life. And he's real, he is real, real proud. Uh, he told me over a while back he named all the millionaires that he'd coached. He named all the preachers. He even named some of them the doctors that were head of uh, technical institutions uh, uh, around over the state. But he's real proud of his fellows, and he's done a great job. And I, I really, I think that he probably paid maybe other than my mother and my father the most important part of my life because he made a man out of me and he made me realize at any time and this is what he believed in when you went went after something give it your best ability give it all you had give it 100 percent if you can this this is what you got to do and he made me realize and this is what i have tried for and this is the way i've tried to raise my children since i've been out of school it's a it's a real honor for me to have opportunity to, to say how I feel about Coach Frank Howard. I wish I could say it as well as two of my old teammates just did. There'll never be, as uh, Tom mentioned, there'll never be another Frank Howard, and Billy mentioned it too. He's one of a kind and uh, was a great football player uh, himself at Alabama and later a greater coach. I don't think I ever borrowed any money from him, but if I had, you can rest assured that he would open up his drawer and look, and he'd have it alphabetized and see if I owed him any money. <laughs> he, would, he would never turn down anybody that needed a small loan, like, you know, at that time it was maybe two or three dollars. But if he did, he wrote it down, and to this day, he still has that list, and uh, I just went fishing with Coach Wade and Sammy Kraut, a boy that was on his uh, Sugar Bowl team, I believe, still owes him a few dollars. And uh, Don and I had gone fishing with Sammy Kraut just last week, and the last thing Coach Howard told us, he said, tell that boy to send that money he owes me. <laughs> and that was for the 59 uh, Sugar Bowl team. I remember one time we were getting ready for Wake Forest. This is a story that I'm sure some of you heard, but I like to repeat it. They had what they called a Gregor's Trap, I believe. Gregor's was a famous player there at Wake Forest, and uh, they were giving everybody fits with the trap that this player was running, Gregor's. And uh, so Coach Howard, being a thorough, thorough coach as he is, he wanted to really concentrate on this in, in the practices. So I think Coach McFadden was running the, the Bohunk team against, the, uh, against our defense, and. Uh, they were running this Gregor's trap pretty often, and uh, but it wasn't running it often enough to suit Coach Howard. He says, Mac Fed, he says, you're not running that Gregor's trap enough, are you? He's, and Mac Fed says, Coach, I'm running it two out of three times as we go. And Coach Howard said, that ain't enough, Mac Fed, run it every other time. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, I know Coach Howard knew that mathematically he wasn't making a sound statement. I know he knew that. <laughs> Another thing he would do, if you were having a long, terrible scrimmage out there and going over two hours and not accomplishing anything, he used to always say, boys, it ain't long before we're reaching the law of diminishing returns. But before he got to that point, if, uh, the morale was low and uh, things weren't going good and all of a sudden we'd get a little blood on one play. He'd run over there and dip his fingers in it and rub it on his cheeks and say, now ain't I a mean son of a bitch. <laughs> 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 and that would break up the whole squad and we'd relax and the practice would go good from there on in and we probably wouldn't have to take but 10 laps around the post after that. <laughs> Another of Coach Howard's players was Don Wade of the late 40s, early 50s, and one time assistant coach at Clemson. Two or three things that stand out. Mandy, he expected the very best out of you. And like he told us a number of times in a tough ball game or something, we're close or we're behind or something. He said, fellas, do your dead level best. And if that ain't good enough, do something better than that. And he was always wanting you to excel, to achieve, to overcome, and uh, to actually do better, not only on the football field, but he felt in life. Do better than you actually are capable of doing. And you'll be a success, he said. 
Uh, he was interested in your character. He wanted you to leave Clemson a better man or a better person than you were when you got here. I remember he used to talk to uh, all the mamas and daddies, my, my parents. He said, I'm going to kick him in the rear end when he needs it, and I'm going to encourage him when, when he needs it, and said, I'm going to turn him out of here when he leaves here. I think he might have been Maybe not a comfortable situation for father or son in most instances. However, this one worked out just fine for Coach Howard and his highly recruited son, Jimmy. Yeah, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him, so I guess, obviously, he means a pretty good bit to me. When I was growing up, I didn't see him all that much. He went to work at 6.30 or 7 in the morning and got back after dark, and, uh, you know, every now and then he'd paddle me or switch me or something like that when I needed it. One of the funniest things he told me when I was being recruited in, uh, out of high school, I had a lot of scholarships and he told me I could go to any school in the country I wanted to go. He said if I didn't get a scholarship or couldn't earn one that he would pay my way through college. He said there, there were two places I could not go though. One of them was to the University of Alabama because if I went down there, Bear Bryant would probably kill me. And he said if I went to the unit, the other one, other place was the University of South Carolina. He said if I went there, he would kill me. <laughs> tell you, I really uh, probably got closer to my father several years ago when he almost died. You know, he had some gallbladder surgery, and uh, I knew he was going to be all right uh, because when he came out of his coma or whatever he was in. Uh, I said, Daddy, you know you died. And he said, I didn't know that. He was still in a fog. Uh, did you see St. Peter up in heaven when you died? He said, no, I don't remember that. And I said, well, uh, did you see Satan? He said, no, I don't remember seeing Satan. He said, but I must have gone to hell because I do remember seeing old P. Ed Walker. <laughs> In 1967, 68, and 69, Clemson was fortunate enough to have one of the finest running backs in the nation in the person of Buddy Gore. Well, when you talk about Coach Howard, you, uh, or I do anyway, you can't help but get a smile on your face and, and think about a lot of memories and, uh, and some good times and some bad times. Uh, the things that stick out in my mind about Coach Howard are kind of really basic. Uh, Coach Howard, you always knew where you were with him. Uh, he, he was a man of, uh, of a few words, and, uh, and what he said was what he believed in. When I first got there to Clemson, all of a sudden we huddled up, and we didn't know what he was going to do. He kind of lined up some dummies, and he'd say, okay, we're going to do some cheer blocking. And I, you know, I didn't know I played football most all of my, my life, I guess. And all of a sudden he says, okay, I want you right over cheer, and I want you right over cheer. You know, and this was, I kind of backed up, I said, man, this is cheer blocking, you know. And one thing I always noticed, I'd go by his office on a Monday or Tuesday, and he, it was in the off season, he was coming back from somewhere, he was there writing a personal note. And I said, coach, what you doing? And he'd be there and say, come on in here, Gore. And I'd go in and he'd say, look here, I said, look at this big bag of sweet potatoes that so-and-so down in Marion County dropped off for me. And he'd be there writing a personal note to this individual, personally thanking them for that. And he says, I've just learned that if you notice the little things in life that we all take for granted, if you just thank people along the way, it just, uh, it just means so much more to you. The word legend is about the most overworked word in the English language as overworked as a mule on a South Carolina farm. But not in the case of Coach Frank Howard. Coach Howard is a legend in the truest sense of the word. We regret not having time for more of Coach Howard's former players. However, we want to meet other coaches, officials, press members, and more. Are you the more that's got the Carolina Clemson game? I said, yes, sir, coach, but you can take me out of it right now. He said, no, they put you in it, suits me. So that's the time they had the ineligible lineman down the field, mm -hmm. and Frank loses the game, I think, 
by a close score. But he has a lineman down the field. And my, I went home that night, and my phone rang off the hook. People driving by my house, and you don't drive by my house. It's a dead-end street. Yeah. Then again, in 1960, we go to Clemson the first time. Clemson's playing up there, and Carolina is caught for a safety mm -hmm. and have to punt the ball from the 20. He elects to punt the ball from the 20. And it kicked it real high, up about 30 yards up to the 50-yard line. And the Clemson man is going to look like he's going to catch it. Then he backs away, let's hit the ground, because the Carolina line went all around him. Well, the ball rolls on the ground, and a Carolina man puts his hand on the ball and downs it. It's Carolina's ball now, free ball. So I tell John, Don, Johnny, who's the referee, I said, John, did Carolina down the football? He said, yes. I said, well, it's Carolina's football. He looks up in there and thinks a minute and said, you're right. So you go tell Coach Howard. I said, oh, hell no. You go tell Coach Howard. I'm going across the field and tell Marvin Bass. <laughs> uh, I'm sure, Ray, you remember B.C. and Abinett. Oh, yeah. Who played in the line for him. Coach Howard, a huge follower. Coach, of course, very fond of him. B.C. served as a straight man for many of, many of Coach Howard's stories. I recall once one that Coach Howard likes to tell they went to a pizza park, mm -hmm. and BC ordered the largest pizza the, yes, they, 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 they made in that establishment. And the waitress asked him if, uh, if he wanted that in six or four pieces. And he said, you better make it four. I'm not sure I can eat six. <laughs> uh, That's the good. That's Coach good. Howard was, well, he liked to talk. Oh, and and he, I think he carried on the conversation throughout games. Oh, yeah, yeah. Every time you get close to him, he'd holler to you. Yeah. I had Texas Christian one time, a fellow was running a punt back for a touchdown. And as he ran by Frank, old Frank spit tobacco juice on him, <laughs> on, the, on the grass. And I'm following behind him 15 yards, mm -hmm. and when I came by, he hollered, catch him, though, catch yeah. him. <laughs> like I could help him. Yeah. No way. That's very true that he is, uh, he, he is well known. He, uh, his face is recognized throughout the state. But Bob Jones, a long time assistant yeah. coach, oh, coach gentleman. Howard, tells a story. But they were riding in the country, through the country one, one day on the back road, and they ran out of gas. Coach Howard was driving. So Bob Jones walked to a nearby service station and got, brought a can of gas back and got the car onto the station. And neither of them had any money on them. So Coach Howard, the, the attendant at the station, agreed to take a check. And so Coach Howard wrote the check and, of course, signed it Frank Howard. And as he handed it to the man, he says, you know who that is, don't you? And the guy said, well, I hope to hell it's you. <laughs> Howard's respect for Warren Gizay was genuine. Well, I'd like to uh, mention what a great competitor Coach Howard uh, was. And we had the opportunity of participating against him uh, for five years here at the University of South Carolina. But we knew him uh, for quite a number of years prior to that uh, at the University of Maryland. Jim Tatum, one of the greatest coaches of all times, uh, always had a great uh, uh, warm spot his heart for Coach Howard because of the great competitor that he was, a, a really fair, uh, tough guy that uh, turned out football teams uh, that could block and tackle, and those are the kinds that can win. He had the opportunity of uh, defeating uh, our football team one year, uh, seven to nothing, and it's probably most noteworthy that his team didn't throw a single pass. Now, I was known as three yards in a cloud of dust, and he was known as a more wide open coach. But in this particular situation, uh, the score was seven to nothing. Uh, Clemson won, and Clemson didn't uh, throw a pass. I think few people realize uh, the great reputation and the tremendous amount of confidence that other coaches had in him uh, around the nation. Of course, he's a great speaker, but he was a great football coach first. And uh, my hat's off to Coach Howard for the magnificent job that he did at Clemson and the job he's now doing, uh, keeping alive uh, the wonderful uh, uh, reputation uh, that he has made uh, throughout his coaching career.
Remarkable people ever associated with a coach through the years is Sports Information Director Bob Bradley. I think uh, if one word described Frank Howard, it would be honesty. Uh, um, he seconded his own nomination to be the head coach at Clemson. Uh, he had a one-year contract. Uh, he lost it after four months, and he didn't have another one for the next 30 years. And I think that pretty well sums up that people trusted Frank Howard and Frank Howard trusted people. I think probably that Frank Howard would be remembered as he, he was one of the giants in Southern football as well as uh, Clemson football. I think he put Clemson on the map. Uh, I know we had John Heisman here at the turn of the century, but Frank Howard came in here and, and uh, he carried these teams to six bowls and uh, I, I just think he's, he's going down and be remembered like uh, Wallace Wade at Alabama and Duke and Bobby Dodd at Georgia Tech and General Nadlin at Tennessee. I think that Frank Howard has left a legacy here at Clemson that uh, no, nobody's going to really come in and, and do what he did to, to uh, foster uh, Clemson football, Clemson athletics, and the Clemson University itself. The reason that all of us are here at Clemson, all of us in athletics, and the reason we have the program we have is because of Coach Howard and the hours and the time and the leadership that he put into it. So One day he told me about the difference in what way an AD works today and the way an AD worked uh, 20, 25 years ago, and that is that now when we do a contract with someone, we have to go through a lot of legalese and sign it and get everything done. He said uh, it used to be when he would do a contract, somebody would call him and say, Coach, have you done any contract? Have you taken it? He said, son, when I sat behind this desk, that contract was good. End of story. And the bottom line is that he was the boss, and what he said went. There's no doubt about it. IPTE is the lifeline to the Clemson athletic program. This is confirmed by Allison Dalton, the executive director of IPTE. It's important that you have the active input of a coach, and of course, Coach Frank Howard uh, came here for coach from, to coach with Coach Neely. But the more important thing was, after he became head coach, he took a very active role in supporting IPTE, and of course made uh, many trips all over the state of South Carolina, making contacts for IPTE, uh, attending meetings for IPTE. As a matter of fact, I don't think that there's ever been a head coach that contributed more to the formation of an athletic support group than Frank Howard did to the formation of IPTE. And I'm not sure that we would have ever gotten where we are had the head coach, being Frank Howard, not made that commitment. Sporting his Murphy High School cap, Coach Howard answers some long-standing questions near the fabled rock at the top of the hill, the hill that leads into Death Valley. We went out there and played. We played, tried to play good, hard, tough, fundamental football. And uh, if we saw well, what we were doing wasn't going to work, we'd change it a little bit. Uh, fortunately, I had some pretty good football players, boys like Fred Cohn and uh, Joel Wells and boys like that, and they could do most anything, and thank the good Lord I had those kind. One time a fella came to me, he says, Coach, we was losing. He says, Coach, what these folks don't like about you is you chewing tobacco. Uh, he said, now why don't you get your cigar and just light it up, and I mean don't light it up, and, they, and you chew on that cigar and everybody will think you're smoking and they won't think you're uh, chewing tobacco. Said, you know, that's not what these alumni don't like about me. I said, the thing they don't like about me is all these losses. I said, you know, when uh, uh, we win and I'm chewing tobacco, I said, that's the cutest thing you ever saw. But when we lose, that's the nastiest thing you ever saw. And that's the way it is. If you win, you get by a lot of things. 
Many of our national sports figures out of the past have a superstitious nature about them. How about Coach Howard? I remember one fella used to always send me some Buckeyes from up around Pickens. I still got some of those things. And to be perfectly honest and frank with you, if we started off winning, I'd try to wear the same shoes, I'd wear the same suit, uh, wear the same shirt, the same tie. I didn't want to do anything to jeopardize our winning. And I reckon I was a little superstitious. Uh, I got better sense than to be superstitious, but you're that way anyway. Uh, uh, I've had so many good players, so many good boys, and um, the team that I probably respect the most is my 1948 uh, Gator Bowl team. And you know, on that team, uh, we got uh, six boys off of that 1948 team is now millionaires. Fred Cohn ain't one of them, but um, <laughs> we got some good ones. And um, they played good and they were good boys. They liked each other. None of them weighed, except one, weighed over 200 pounds. All of them weighed about 197 pounds. It looked like dwarfs out there today, but I still think they could hold their own with any team. They are fast and quick and like to play and they liked each other, and they just go out there and get after it. Here's the story of how the rock came about, which really is the reason well, Memorial uh, Stadium is affectionately rock, called a, Death uh, Valley. A long background. We used to play Presbyterian College um, every year, and we'd beat them pretty bad. And they had a coach down there named Lonnie McMillan. McMillan. He said coming into this place was just like uh, going into Death Valley. Well, I started calling it Death Valley. We had an alumnus named Mr. Jones. He lived at the Clemson house up there. And he was traveling out in Death Valley one time and he stopped by and he brought me this rock hymn. And this rock laid around my office about, oh, I'd say three years. One day I told Gene Willeman, I got tired of looking at it in the office. I told Gene Willeman, I said, take this rock out there and throw it in the valley. I thought he was just gonna pitch it over the fence. So he came out here and he built this little thing, looked like a water fountain, put the rock on top. Well, I looked at it and I said, well, he did a lot more than I was expecting. So I used to have this television program, and on that television program one day, I mentioned this rock. I told them, I told all the football players that all of them that was gonna give a 110% when they came down to the stadium, we always ran down this hill. When they came in the stadium, um, um, they could rub my rock. I said, now if any of you is not going to uh, give me 110%, don't put your filthy hands on this rock. I got a letter from a lady over in Traveler's Rest said, uh, Dear Coach, if you believe more in the Lord and less in those rocks, you'd be a lot better football coach. <laughs> Some people didn't have a sense of humor back then. <laughs> Since Coach Howard's retirement as head coach in 1969, the Alabama connection continues. Three former coaches preceded the highly successful Danny Ford. The first time that I ever met Coach Howard, uh, other than having an opportunity to play against one of his football teams uh, when Clemson and Alabama played, we were uh, probably in 1970 and uh, he was the guest speaker at Columbus Touchdown Club in Columbus, Georgia. And, I was sent there by the University of Alabama to represent Alabama's athletic department as a graduate assistant. And uh, Coach Bryant said, make sure you go by and see Coach Howard and knock on his door and tell him who you are. And that, uh, Coach Bryant sent his best wishes. So uh, we got at the hotel, knocked on the door, and you could hear that old voice of his say, you know, come in, and I did. And uh, he said, what do you want? He thought it was room service, I guess, but the uh, <laughs> first time that, that uh, I was given the opportunity to coach at Clemson, he was at the press conference, and uh, I think it was shortly thereafter the press conference, uh, if, 
and naturally I was scared to death and, and, and <laughs> couldn't hardly even talk or breathe or anything else. And, and I was pulled aside shortly there by Coach Howard. And he sat in the back and listened, and, and, or tried to listen. He couldn't hear, he said. But uh, as he finished, uh, we finished, he came to, to what was now my office and, and said, and said, now I want to always happy if I can and I don't want to hurt you I want to try to you know, help you through the rough times and they will be rough times and he was exactly right on that and he said but you better start with when you talk you better look at people when you talk and quit looking at the floor so the first time that I started my job he he, he uh, he uh, critiqued me or, or whatever, and I have improved. I do hold my head up a little bit now, so I'm better than I was, but I have to say that he was the first guy to come in there and, and, and tell me. I know that the, the things that I have problems with more so back then than I do now because I have more confidence now. And the longer you do something, the, the more confidence you should have, and that's everybody, not just me. But, but I think that the what when it was rough early and I didn't know what to do and I really didn't know what to do and a lot of it was trial and error a lot of, a lot of it was guessing that, that he helped more then and, and gave me good advice and, and, uh, and than I can ever appreciate or tell him thank you for but I we have just highlighted the illustrious career of coach Frank Howard he has touched the lives of so many across this great land of ours. His legacy will be with Clemson University and the state of South Carolina for years to come. <laughs>